this is the uh, etiquette that we were talking about, uh, the meetups being recorded. Uh, as you're already seeing, there will be uh, technical difficulties throughout the event um, as we, you know, just sort of keep our, our live stream going. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun and it's a little scary every time we do this. Uh, we run into some new snag. Uh, so be patient with us, uh, we'll get there. Um, as you can see, we've got um, uh, a, a presence on the social media. And uh, so lots of hashtags that you can use to share your experience and future experiences with the GDG, uh, with Flutter, uh, Flutter Firebase. And then um, we also have the Woman Tech Maker uh, hashtag. Um, and so, yeah, please go lots of stuff with that uh, information. So let's see, this is the schedule that we are um, abiding by tonight. We're in the middle of the opening remarks right now, and um, uh, our guest tonight is Paul, Paul Ruiz, and he's going to be talking about the, the prototyping with the, the Flutter and Firebase. I'm really, really excited about this. For me, this is the, I'm just super excited because um, it's very uh, relatable to what I'm doing uh, personally at work. Um, so um, we have an hour of him just telling us how it is. And while he's talking, you'll be able to add your questions to the, am I saying this right, Um How do they say that? What is that uh, uh, platform? I think it's Silo. So uh, we'll be sharing that link um, before the uh, before Paul starts. And you can, there it is, side, slide, <laughs> I can't say that, Slido, Slido, like Scooby-Doo. Like Slido? Okay, well, there's it's a link. Sli it's Slido, you're right. Slido, okay. Uh, we'll share that link. Um, and um, so while uh, while the talk is going on, you'll be able to uh, post your questions in there. It's pretty cool. What happens is the questions, uh, you see your question, but you'll see everyone else's question, and you can thumbs up a good question. Questions that get the most popularity, those are the ones that we'll be asking during the Q&A. So um, our agenda... We, um, then is that we'll uh, we'll have um, uh, Paul speak. We'll have Q and A. Then we'll talk about um, our sponsors and our raffle, and we'll win prizes. We do the the wheel of names. That's uh, where we'll collect your names um, and your attendance in some forms, and we'll add those. Uh, we'll spin a wheel. Someone's going to win. We're going to uh, connect with you, and you're going to um, get the prizes tonight. Finally, uh, we'll have a wrap-up where um, other organizers can give us some information about what their uh, groups are doing, and uh, we can talk a little bit about what's happening uh, in the future, and then we'll just open it up uh, for people to say hello and, um, you know, just have an open, open session, so to speak. So let's see here. Um, I think next we want to... Jason, I think you're probably ready to uh, do the opening remarks. I'm sorry, I got muted there. Yes, anytime you'd like, if you're ready. Yep, I'm all set. Okay, great. So um, much of what's going on tonight uh, during our meetup was covered great already by Chad, um, you know, as far as like how it will unfold, our speaker's uh, name and the topic, um, like how we'll interact, you know, um, that it's an inclusive environment and um, how even the prize strategy is, is kind of works its way in. So I'll just add a couple of points. I mean, this is a really great um, just overarching trend that we're seeing here. Um, when we reached out during COVID-19 and started doing some remote meetups, we got some amazing buy-in from all kinds of other GDGs, both in North America and then reaching out internationally. It's been uh, amazing how this, you know, pandemic has really caused a lot of people to get actually closer in online communities, it's particularly software development. And we, it's exemplified here and it's documented in our, our YouTube um, channel and, and what we've been able to, to do here. So I'm hoping that with over, you know, about 114, 115 people, we'll be able to, um, get through the material, learn something new, um, maybe bounce ideas off each other, possibly find opportunities by talking to each other. That's the goal. And um, uh, on the, sl on the uh, screen right now, we just want to um, you know, acknowledge specifically the sponsorship we have for this event. Some of the names you'll see on here 
come from our local area. Uh, Janelle Group is where Chad works. It's a local software development agency in New York Tech Loop. Sort of reinforces the software development community in the area. It's, a, it's a, almost a, uh, a force of a force of nature for pulling together the various areas of the region in terms of uh, tech development. And then we have a lot of other uh, sponsors from you know other GDG chapters that brought in as well. So it's a great example of, uh, example, if you will, of um, working together. And on this slide, obviously, you see the breadth of GDG chapters that are involved in pulling this together. It seems like every time we have an event, this list gets a little bit larger, one or two, maybe possibly four or five at a time. Uh, it's it's quite, quite remarkable how many people are collaborating on this. We thank you all for that. Next slide, please. So just some stats here, I guess, as far as, um, you know, attendees and kind of where they came from in terms of uh, registration on meetup sites. So pretty pretty good uh, turnout here and uh, you know we're represented in the numbers we've got quite a quite a turnout relative to what signed up I'd say maybe we would uh, possibly uh, be looking for some more people to jump in but um, maybe some people are on the live stream as well so uh, with that I mean I think we're ready to discuss kind of how these prize raffle drawing process works so I'll hand that over Erika? Yes, I guess it's with me now. Uh, my name is Erika from DDD Winnipeg. Thank you everybody for joining us and the thank you to DDD Capital to bound guide this event. That is so nice to see how many people we have it. Uh, we appreciate everybody here and we draw, uh, draw a raffle. Uh, we have like prizes come with like the education IO, two subscription, three months, plus practicum, practicums. We have also scholarships and black type pipeline. And we all attend these. We will have like a Coursera um, course credits that we will be describing after. Um, and also we have developer her and with tech in a woman tech prize as well, okay? We will ask everybody to uh, answer our survey and we will get the names and we uh, will uh, draw the hubble. Thank you. Vishal, can you present? Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is Vishal from Houston. Uh, we are from GDG Houston. So today we have two three-month subscriptions access to all courses on Educative. Educative is a platform where uh, it is completely text-based and you can all practice everything online without the need to install any software. I tried it uh, for Firebase and it was good. I also learned Python in there. So make sure you stay until the end and uh, whoever stays until the end will be entered into the feedback as Erika said and two of them will be able to get three full month subs like three month subscription for all the courses on educative which is worth uh, a lot and everyone uh, will also get 10 percent discount code to firebase and Flutter courses that are there on educative platform if you're interested okay. perfect so um, i think uh, it's my turn here Okay, and I'd like to present the next um, the next award that we'll have is from hashtag Black Tech Pipeline Practicum by Yamex. I, I think now it's the time for Atria, Leo. Oh, <laughs> sorry. So no. I think we will have uh, um, the Atria representative, uh, Kaushik Raju, member board of trustees at uh, Atria University uh, speaking. I don't know if he us. Uh, if not, uh, I think uh, who is presenting that tree? I don't remember who is. Hi, it's Tina from GDG Winnipeg. I'll be presenting a tree at the Institute of Technology. Okay. So go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Atria Institute of Technology. Is a, we're so happy to have them as a sponsor. Um, they're excited to announce.
share with you a wealth of fun, and you'll receive an invitation link from a trip to Sarah uh, in one day. You can complete the form at the end, uh, by the end of September 2020, but you have to enroll uh, before July 30th. Take any course you want, and any number of courses you want. Keep in mind that the link will be shared with all the attendees at the end of the raffle. Thank you again, the Tria Institute for Technology. I would like to give the word to uh, Adria representative is here with us, Kaushik Raju. Are you, can you unmute uh, yourself? Hi. Are you? Ah, okay. Hi. We do have another uh, another offer from Practicum. Practicum is offering a special discount of 20% when being forced to use it if you need it and have to fill out in the following form. And I believe that uh, if it's not in here, I can pop the link and paste it on the form. Yeah, and uh, so, uh, Olga, I believe, please share it in the other chat as well. And there is another uh, offer from uh, Practicum. They are offering uh, also a special discount of 20% to any course to use it. The, the end, you will need to fill a form and uh, we can uh, share that uh, link uh, with uh, everybody. Next, I think it's Shabba. Shabba. Thank you. 
important is to you and to you to become swimming coach. And we know that women team has gone on a on a, a on transition, sorry, in three years to of uh, three thousand dollars, six five thousand dollars, and even three thousand dollars. The same thing in nutrition with this program. Now you have to uh, do that, but you have to take action and apply today, and you will find the link uh, at the top of the slide. Jason. Oh, if you're muted, Jason. Jason, are you ready? Nope, Jason, you're muted. I am. I, I am. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay, great. So yeah, I mean, um, leading up to this point, I've seen uh, you know, just a great deal of, of coming together. Everybody's been pulling together with the sponsorships and the support. You saw it exemplified in all of the handoffs here. It's a really great team effort. I just want to thank everybody that's presented and everybody that's supporting this for, you know, um, I guess honoring me with being able to uh, introduce our featured speaker. I'll start by letting you know what you'll learn and then I'll tell you a bit about Paul. So, if you ever need to make an app quickly, such as for a hackathon or a prototype, but you don't know where to start exactly, well, in this talk from Paul, you'll learn about Flutter, which is Google's cross OS development platform, as well as Firebase, Google's back end of the service, and how they're used together to quickly make your ideas, quickly make your ideas and turn them into beautiful and functional prototypes. We have a really great person to kind of bring us through that, um, Paul Ruiz. Paul is a developer of programs engineer on Firebase with a background in Android and IoT development. Outside of work, he makes movie props as a hobby and is a member of the Star Wars costuming charity where he volunteers at events at various movie char as various movie characters, including an Imperial Stormtrooper, uh, X-Wing pilot, or Tuscan Raider. Before getting into tech, Paul was a zookeeper, so please feel free to ask him any giraffe-related questions. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Paul to uh, bring us through the topic tonight. Thank you, Paul. Can we switch the presentation? Maybe Shaima uh, stop presenting so we can give the presentation to Paul. And thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Paul. Hey, okay. Um, are you able to see my screen while I'm actually working? <laughs> awesome. Cool. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Reese again. Um, I'm a both Today we're going to talk about three tools, Flutter and Firebase, and how they can be used for app prototyping. Let's make sure this works. There we go. Uh, so whether it's at a hackathon, it's only one weekend to build something with another one, or you have an idea for an app, or you want to test out before really investing in it, a lot of us have been in a situation where we want to build something that gets the job done quickly. So during the normal prototyping development process, developers will plan out their app, you know, how it should, what it should do, how it should work, uh, they'll reach the feasibility idea, map out their architecture, pick their tools, Build a clean, organized prototype, right? So yes and no. <laughs> um, some people stick to a very formal process, but when building out a quick prototype or proof of concept app, most of us, myself included, just want to open up an IDE and start coding, and then we'll kind of figure it out as we go along. So given this, I'm going to talk about the two tools I mentioned earlier, Flutter and Firebase. Both of these are easy to use and address different development problems. Flutter is for client-side development, and Firebase is for the back end. Both are designed to be easy to use, and they're um, well supported with content documentation to make getting up and running as easy as possible uh, when you're starting out. So while I wouldn't say this is necessarily a deep dive, uh, this presentation is going to look at a lot of code and tools that will hopefully be helpful to getting you started with Flutter Firebase. So while it might be a lot up front, I can't stress enough that you don't need to memorize everything. All of the code that I show you in this presentation will be available in the slides when I share them out after this talk. I believe there's a recording going on as well. So, don't panic. <laughs> um, so what I hope to do with this talk is help you lead with the vocabulary, looking at both of these tools first and when you're ready to use them. So with that, let's just go ahead and get started and into the presentation. So first let's talk about Flutter. It's a UI toolkit that uses the Dart programming language for building native apps for multiple platforms on top of C++ using a 2D engine called Skia, which is the same graphical engine that's used for like Chrome, Android, and a few other platforms, and it's offered a single SDK. Since everything is built on a single code base, you can create your prototypes for multiple systems, such as Android or iOS, without requiring specific development knowledge about either platform. Flutter is also completely open sourced. 
not only is Google working on it, but so are many developers in the developer data pool. So rather than being walled off from the internal working of the team, you can dig into the code to see exactly how Flutter is doing and what it's doing, as well as send your own pull requests if you want to. So once all that's said and done, uh, you'll end up with a 
this stunning example of a beautiful, simple interface that does pretty much nothing. <laughs> uh, so before we really get into how to use some useful common widgets, I want to divert for a moment to touch on how Flutter can be used on multiple platforms. We've all seen apps made with multi-platform tools, but they just don't quite look right compared to what the session has for a standard UI, such as Android apps that look like they were designed for iOS. What makes Flutter handy here is that it's um, able to tell what platform it's on, so you can apply the proper UI elements for your app based on the OS. So you can actually see here in this example that we're using the same app on two different devices, one's iOS and one's Android, but they both look native to the respective platform that they're on. So this functionality is available through the Dart.io package that can be uh, imported into your app. When the user is on iOS, the platform dot is iOS flag will be triggered. If the user is on a different OS, then that flag will come back and false. Uh, there's also an is Android flag that does the same thing on that platform, so my fellow Android developers don't need to feel left out by this one. Um, you can also see that we're using a standard ternary statement here to expand the proper widget for whatever platform the user is on. After you've checked against that flag, you can uh, expand an iOS-specific Cupertino widget, which is this whole other package that's available within Flutter that contains these iOS-style widgets. Uh, so for this example, we'll look at using an iOS-style slider from that Cupertino package. Uh, you will need to make sure that you actually import this Dart package though into your app, so that's what you see at that top highlighted line. Because uh, if you don't import that, then you're not going to have that available, because it's actually available in a separate package, not just in the stock components with Flutter. Uh, if the user isn't on an iOS device, then you can just expand a regular slider as a part of the second option in this ternary operation. Finally, you can see that both of these sliders have properties that can be set on them. While the base properties are the same in this incomplete example, there are some differences in the components, such as a background color property that can only be applied to a regular slider. Um, I guess you could apply it to the other one too, it's not going to do much for you. <laughs> Um, so you'll want to check the documentation of the source whenever you use a platform specific component to make sure you're setting the correct attributes rather than assuming they're always the same. And then since that last slide for the sake of space used an incomplete sample, I've included a complete sample for a slider here for everyone. So the value of the slider is actually a double that is saved outside of the widget, and the uh, active and inactive colors are set for the material design version of this widget, and the on-change property is set to maintain state as the slider is used. One thing to pay attention to is that if the on-change property isn't set, then this slider is actually going to be unusable, so you won't be able to slide or do anything with it. So, like a lot of things in Flutter, this widget is pretty straightforward, but you will need to look into the source or documentation to understand why certain properties are needed and what they do, which, I mean, you can really say about any platform, so there's that. <laughs> so, the next component that I want to talk about is the list, since, honestly, most apps are essentially just list detail streams. There's actually a lot that you can do with lists, like setting them up for intense scrolling, having items react to long presses, and adding various custom composite widgets that each do different things. So to keep everything simple for this example, we'll start by just looking at the code for a super basic list of generated text items with a circle icon. After that, we'll take a moment to look at adding a swipe to dismiss feature to your list, similar to what you can see in this demo image. Um, if you're coming from the Android World Recycler View, you'll hopefully be surprised by how simple this is, especially when you compare it to like the way Android uses standard view holder patterns, decorators, and that whole mess. <laughs> um, so the first widget here is the scroll bar. While it's not necessary, it does provide, as you can probably guess, a scroll bar at the side of a list so that users know how far along in the data that they are. After that is the actual list view widget, which provides the scrollable area that contains and controls the list items. This widget also has a collection of properties that can be set to customize the list. Here you can see that you're setting that we're setting a padding to the top and bottom of the list view. So the only required property is the children group, which will house the items that exist inside of that list. The next part is where this component gets a little bit more interesting. So, uh, well, you can include a simple list for data, like array data structure uh, with other widgets. There's also this great like, list.generate call that can loop a set number of times to gen uh, create widgets in your list view. So in this case, we're simply going to create 100 items that will be displayed in our app. So each of those 100 items will be made up of a single list tile widget, which will implement the material design spec for list items for you out of the box. And is, um, in general, it uses place of text and a leading item, like an icon, for each list item. So this is actually like what we saw in the previous uh, screenshot. I think I have another screenshot coming up here. So as you might expect, this list tile has its own properties. The first one is the exclude semantics widget, which wraps a circular avatar. 
So this will display an index for the generated list and an uh, icon at the start of the list item. And since it's wrapped by this exclude semantic widget, uh, it won't be read by accessibility tools like screen readers, meaning it doesn't add noise for users that need to use those tools. So it's worth noting, though, that whenever you use an exclude semantic widget, they use it sparingly. And you only use it when there's a very specific and beneficial reason to use it uh, to get around the accessibility tools. Just because people actually do rely on those, you don't want to take away from any of those accessibility uh, features. So the final part of the list tile widget is in our list view. It's probably the most simple. It's just a single text string um, in a text widget that represents the content of a list item. And we already saw that in like, our Hello World example. So this text widget will actually come into play in a few of our examples. So while that wasn't very much code, it does create a simple list view for our folder apps. I actually have the exact code running in this graphic, so, um, but I also modified it to include a swipe to this feature. So we can talk about how you would add that to something uh, something like that to your prototypes. So let's just go ahead and dig into that now. The core of this functionality is just yet another widget, like pretty much everything else in Flutter. And in this case, it's called a dismissible. What's nice about this is that we don't need to replace anything in our current list to make a swipe to dismiss work. The dismissable widget just takes the list child widget from the last section and adds it as its own child. Um, if we run our app at this point, each item in the list view would be swipeable. Uh, it would also be removed from the list view if completely swiped off the screen. While optional, that from property does help let uh, users know when they are swiping away on an item by changing what appears behind the list item during the action. In this case, I'm adding a new container widget that sets the background color to a very light green. You can also set a secondary background color if you want the user to see a different background when swiping from the left or the right. So one thing that's worth noting here is that since the background property accepts any widget, you can do some really fun and interesting things in this area, like loading in an animated GIF for that item uh, with status background. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you should, it just means that you can. <laughs> uh, but when you're playing with things or if you want to do anything kind of creative with your app, um, anywhere that you have a widget generally means that you can use any other widget that's available within Flutter, which is kind of fun. So like here I have a little sparky animated GIF, which is not necessary, but it's kind of cool. Uh, so now that we've looked at what you can do with the background of a dismissible, let's get into a couple more properties. The first is key. This is a unique property that needs a unique value to keep things in order while removing items from your list as it interacts with the actual data structure driving the UI. To keep things simple, you can usually just use Flutter's unique key class to assign a random unique key to your dismissible list item. So that's what this one line here is for. Finally, there's the on dismissed callback. While this isn't required by the dismissible, it is useful when you want to display something to your user to let them know that they have removed an item from this list. Uh, this is also where you can notify your backend that an item was removed if it's hosted remotely. That way it doesn't show back up for your user the next time they open your app. And then since they're fairly often the widgets that are actually used in list views, let's go ahead and wrap up our general discussion of widgets by briefly talking about the card design pattern, uh, which you can actually see here in this uh, GIF demo image here. That's what we're going to be talking about. So like most widgets in Flutter, this snippet is pretty lean. The size box means each card will have a predefined height, and that size box will wrap a child card widget, which sets some general properties for the card, like the shape and basic behaviors. Next up is the child of that child, which in this case is an inkwell. The inkwell is kind of an interesting widget, as it's what the card uses to figure out interactive touch areas, so when the user is actually touching on their screen to interact with those cards. You can also set, uh, set a touch area color, such as the ripple effect in Android, by setting the splash and highlight color. Uh, if you don't want these to show up though, what you can do is you can actually set these properties to colors.transparent, like we're doing on this, uh, this uh, third highlighted line, uh, just so they don't actually show up. Finally, that equal has its own child, which you should be seeing a pattern here now, uh, which is the actual content of the card that the user's gonna see. So for this example, it's a custom composite widget called Travel Destination Content. Despite the complexity of the widget that we've abstracted away here, you can see that you can add any sort of widget that you want for job into your cards. But overall, this snippet is just kind of a great example of how Flutter uses a hierarchy of widgets to build out the UI for your users. So, so far we've covered a handful of widgets, um, but we haven't even like broken the surface on how many are actually out there. So to learn more, I would really recommend checking out the Google Developers uh, channel up on YouTube and then look into their Widgets of the Week videos, which I think there was like a hundred, something like that, videos out there. Uh, that each go over an individual widget. Uh, and then you can also check out the official widgets reference documentation on Flutter.dev.
So now that we've covered a handful of common widgets, this next section is where we're going to get into some stuff that's a little bit more interesting um, and useful when it comes to learning the platform quickly and then creating some prototypes. So the first tool that's awesome for getting up and running quickly is the Flutter Gallery app. This app is entirely open source and available on GitHub, meaning you can grab whatever functionality you like out of it to throw into your prototypes. It goes over a collection of widgets that you can use with both Material and Cupertino stylings, and has a lot of other useful features that you can mess around with in this Playground app. Each widget section in this gallery app includes a descriptor, and can bring up the code that was used to create that section. Each widget page also has an icon at the top that will take you directly into the official documentation for the widget that you're looking at. Additionally, there's a variety of tools that, uh, that can show you how to do animations, media callbacks, or display each of the available stock colors in Flutter to help you get your apps put together even faster. Um, the uh, gallery app also includes case studies, so you can see how common features work together in a big picture scenario, rather than just a bunch of one-off widgets. You can see a staggered grid view, hero animations, circular animations, uh, different types in a single list, and a few other useful features in just the screenshots that are right here. So this is great when you're trying to put together a quick prototype, as, um, as you get the examples of animations and interactive components out of the box, rather than just spending a bunch of your time trying to figure out how to work through solve problems from random blog posts online, Stack Overflow, or other documentation. But speaking of documentation, as you probably noticed, I've mentioned it a lot already. So I'm a huge fan of the Flutter Teams documentation and what they've already put together. Especially since a lot of it is just the standard, this component does something sort of stuff, which, I mean, we could do better than even the Firebase kind of did that, so it's, it's great. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that they have is this thing called Flutter Cookbook, which is a documentation page containing various code samples or recipes uh, for common tasks that you might want to do with Flutter. So this is just a sample of what's out there, but you can see that it's a lot of great content that you'll use in almost every app, uh, such as animations, design elements, and networking. So the next thing to talk about, uh, plugins, are essentially a fancy word for libraries or modules, and are one of my favorite parts about Flutter. But because the development community is so active and passionate about the platform, they've created thousands of open source plugins that you can use in your app to easily accomplish tasks without having to reinvent the wheel. You can find most of these plugins by using pub.dev, a site created by Google for searching through plugins and finding their documentation and source code. So with that, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the useful plugins that are out there and how we would actually implement them. Um, especially since a lot of them would be useful for rapid prototypes as you're trying to put them together. So while there's a ton of great third-party plugins out there, I figured I would start with Google Maps, since it's actually one of my favorites, and my go-to when I want to display location information for my users. So in this section, we'll go over the code that I used to actually make this demo image that's up on the screen right now. Google Maps functionality is all wrapped by a Google Map widget which can be displayed on the screen. This widget has the bulk of its functionality handled by the on-map created future method. So if you're not familiar with features in other languages, they're basically one of the ways that Flutter handles asynchronous operations by figuring out what to do uh, in your app before an asynchronous action, during that action, and after that action is finished. So if you're familiar with like Android development, uh, this would be kind of the same thing as async task, but way less awful. So uh, features will come up a few times during this talk, so a really detailed look at this feature is kind of out of scope for this presentation. So this method is actually triggered once the maps data is finished loading. So uh, in this example, for this presentation, uh, what we'll do is we'll load the locations for all of Google's offices around the world as a list of objects that will then be displayed as markers. Once those office locations are loaded, the map data structure of markers will get cleared, and it will loop through each of those offices. Each office will then be converted into a Google Maps marker that designates the office's location, name, and address. Uh, we can also add an action to ONTAP, such as bringing up a navigation screen or displaying additional information about a specific marker location. Um, and then finally, <coughs> we'll take each marker and add it to the global maps data structure that we cleared earlier. Back to the Google Map it, uh, widget. So we can set the initial camera position and zoom level. So in this case, what it's going to be is just like a really high level view in the center of the middle of the Atlantic Ocean at zero, zero. And then finally, we can add a set of markers to be displayed on the Google Map. So it's just going to take the map that we set earlier and then assign it to our Google Map. So next up is Flare Flutter. Flare, uh, Flare Fletcher is a third-party plugin that sells to a 
Twister to say, like most things in Flutter. <laughs> uh, but I thought it was just kind of too cool to not include in this talk. This plugin is great when you want to animate icons, buttons, and other items in your app to add some extra kick to your UI, which is always great when you're trying to sell an idea to someone or show it off for a hackathon judge. It's worth noting, noting that you can um, do some of this manually using like native widgets, like the animation builder or transform. But honestly, it's not nearly as easy, which is why I actually really like this library, because it just wraps all of that for you and makes it super straightforward to put into your apps. So using their animation website, um, which is like rive.app, um, you can stage out animations that will then be converted into a vector animation file that you can export and run in your app. Overall, it took me roughly 20 minutes of a tutorial on YouTube to learn how to make this fading and spinning star animation and probably set up keyframes. But luckily, once you actually know how to put one animation together, it's really easy to do more of them uh, to put into your apps and just really make things stand out. So once you have your vector animation file exported, using it is as simple as initializing the custom player actor widget in your app, then assigning it to the animation file when you want it to run. You'll also notice that I'm listing the animation title as Go in one of my properties which is what I called my animation um, in the web app before I exported it. So you can see how that's actually linked up and that's not just some arbitrary name that they had. And then while we've talked a lot about rapid prototyping for apps, it's becoming more and more common for people to need to make prototypes that consist of an app with a hardware device. So it's kind of that IoT space. Um, for this next section, I want to briefly touch on Flutter Blue, a third-party plugin that helps you communicate with Bluetooth devices using a Flutter app. So while I won't go into a lot of detail here, uh, this is an area worth knowing for people that need to make IoT prototypes, so I just want to make sure that it's actually at least kind of introduced. The first thing every Bluetooth app needs to do is scan for advertising devices. You can do this by calling Start Scan on a Flutter Blue instance. You can also, and probably should, set a timeout duration to the scan, uh, so the scanning app stops after a period of time. Next, you'll listen for a result to be returned from that scan, and then you can act on those results, like saving a particular device based off of its name or RSSI value, which is the uh, received signal strength of that device. So it's kind of how you can tell how close you are to the physical hardware from your phone. After saving your device, you'll probably want to connect to it using the connect method. Then you can discover the services that are being broadcast by that Bluetooth device. Depending on your setup, you may also want to loop through each of those services to do something with them in your app. Oh shoot. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit escape on me while I was drinking my water. <laughs> um, let's see, so one thing you might want to do is pull each characteristic or piece of information from the broadcasted service. Um, is that still broadcast? Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, so not only can you read those characteristics, but you uh, can also asynchronously write back to your hardware device by using those characteristics. The final thing I want to cover with Flutter Blue is that you can attach a listener to characteristics that will be notified any time uh, new data is pushed to that characteristic by another device, allowing your apps to stay reactive while dealing with the real world. So to wrap up our introduction to Flutter, I want to talk about one of the more common uh, tasks that you'll run into when you're building a new app which is retrieving data from the internet and parsing a JSON payload uh, into dark data objects. So for this sample, we'll go over a simple list app that pulls data from the Etsy API to display inventory amounts for each listing in a single shop. Uh, though the same idea is gonna be kind of carried over to anything else that you have. So if you have other data stored somewhere that you're pulling, same idea. Um, so the first thing you'll wanna do is use a future builder in your app which you may remember is a specific component in Flutter that lets you decide which widgets to show during or after loading data. So in this case, I'm using a new method called future listings. This new method that I created, you um, fetch listings. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Future listings is the object, fetch listings is the actual method. Um, but overall, it's asynchronous, and what it does is it returns a future object with a type of listing, which is a custom object that represents the array items uh, coming from the API. This method will use the HTTP package to get the data from our API endpoint. Um, and I just kind of put Etsy URL in there, so I'm not throwing my personal Etsy URL out. <laughs> um, and if that endpoint returns a 200 success code, then we'll use the JSON.decode method to convert the response into a JSON object, which will then convert it into a listings object. So this is done with a custom object that I created earlier called listings, uh, using some like dark magic under the hood that converts a JSON map into a list of objects with a type of dynamic, which are essentially just 
like undefined generics. So whenever you see that dynamic uh, type, just kind of know that that's what it is. It's not anything in particular that's been defined yet. So once we have the data from that future, we can do another conversion to switch the list of dynamic objects into a, another custom object, uh, which I created earlier is called listing, uh, which is just an additional item from that earlier listings array uh, using similar JSON conversions. This example also stores the list using a simple A to B comparator operator. That sorting operation isn't really necessary. I just kind of figured if you're putting together a rapid prototype and you want things to look nice, you're going to probably want to sort your list at some point. So I wanted to include that code in there for anyone that comes back later and references this. Uh, so after all of that, you can create a new list view of list tiles, just like we did earlier in this presentation. So I'm not going to go super into detail on that part. And then for the last part of the sample, if there isn't any data in the future builder, so like the first time it runs, um, and like the data is loading and whatnot, you can go ahead and display the circular progress indicator until the results are actually available. Uh, it's also good practice to handle error cases in the future builder, though I did in this example to save a little bit of time and space. Um, so that was a ton on Flutter, <laughs> uh, but hopefully it gives you like a good foundation for quickly getting started with your own Flutter apps. So for the second part of this talk, I want to go over Firebase, what it is, and how to use Flutter using the Flutter Fire plugin, which is along the same lines with most other Flutter plugins. Not a super creative name, but it is what it is. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with going over the official pitch for Firebase. Firebase is an application development platform with the mission to help developers succeed by using Firebase products. Firebase accomplishes this by taking common problems and um, developer tasks that occur during your product's life cycle and making them easier to solve, be it by providing more information about your apps and their performance, or providing tools to handle complex problems like security and network connectivity with storing data. Firebase is divided into three uh, main categories of tools with specific goals. Helping your users um, build better, or, uh, sorry, not your users, helping you <laughs> build better apps by making complex coding processes easier, improving app quality by helping you catch issues early and fix them quickly, and helping you grow your app by understanding how other people are using it and engaging with them in meaningful ways. So as you can see, there are actually like 20 different products here, and it would be a whole talk just going through each of them. So while it may seem like a lot, today we're just going to go through a subset of these, um, just the ones that are like the most relevant to actual wrapper prototyping. So again, the goal here isn't to really overwhelm you, but rather just let you know what's available when you need it, and just give you that vocabulary. So before you start diving in using Firebase in your apps, you'll need to create a new project. You can do this at uh, console.firebase.com, and basically just type in a project name, hit next a couple times, um, this will get you set up and into your products console dashboard, which is this like main screen here. The next step will be linking your apps back to Firebase. So for this talk, I'm just going to touch on Android and iOS processes. For Android, you'll need to enter in your apps package name, which you can find in the Android manifest.xml file in your project, and potentially the SHA-1 certificate for your signing key. Uh, one thing to pay attention to is that the SHA-1 certificate is optional, and I mean like hard optional. <laughs> Um, and I really recommend that you skip using it unless it's actually needed for one of the few products that you're going to use in your uh, app, like Google Sign-In or Dynamic Links. Um, there's a few edge cases with the certificate where it might cause some problems down the line because Android package name and SHA-1 pairings are globally unique in Firebase, but that's actually a whole other talk and topic that we can get into some other time or if people have questions, I can answer it later. Um, so after that, you'll need to add some code to your build.gradle files for both core Firebase and the specific uh, Firebase products that you want to use. You'll also be provided with a Google Services JSON file uh, through this, this whole setup process on the Firebase console, which you'll then need to copy into your Flutter app. The iOS process is similar, if not actually a little bit easier. Uh, you'll basically put in your bundle ID, then add some info to a plist file in your app, and then install some pod files for the products that you want to use. After that's done, you should be golden for using Firebase on both iOS and Android from your Flutter app. So the first feature that I want to go over is authentication. So while it's not the most flashy of features, uh, there's always that one hackathon judge that's going to ask you about security, or if you're trying to demo this for people that might give you money, you kind of want to show them, like, hey, this actually is secure. <laughs> uh, so you might as well just opt it in since it is easy, easy enough to use. So Firebase authentication will allow your users to log into your app using a username and password, a phone number, a third-party identity provider like Google or Facebook, or a few other options. So for simplicity, I'm only going to go over a few of these um, that are a little bit more common in like 
uh, real world use. So let's go ahead and get started by discussing user authentication using an email and password. A major part of the setup process occurs in the console. Aside from adding your app to Firebase and updating your POS or including your Google Services JSON file, you'll need to enable each type of Firebase authentication that you will use within your Firebase um, within your app from the Firebase auth section in the Firebase console. I don't think I said Firebase enough times that slide. <laughs> After project setup and enabling auth, you can get back to your code for your app. Using email and password sign-in is actually super easy. So the first thing you will do is register your user's email and password, which you can do by calling the create user with email and password method on a Firebase auth instance. This will also um, automatically log your user in, which is kind of cool. If you want to assign a return user in, you can use the sign in with email and password method just as easily. Next is email link authentication. So this authentication feature takes an email address from the user and then sends them a link that they can um, use to sign in, which is also a link, at the same time proving that they have access to that email address. So just like the email and password method, you'll need to enable email link sign in from the Firebase console. Uh, this is actually an additional option under the email and sign in method, so you just need to go back into that section and then like activate the extra slider that's on there to enable uh, email link sign in. You also need to enable dynamic links in the Firebase console, um, since these are actually what's used to associate your app with the user's email via the send link. Uh, you may also remember from a few slides ago that uh, enabling dynamic links also means that you need to have the SHA list to get added to your app in the Firebase console. So this is going to be one of those cases where you actually would need to get that into, the, into your uh, project setup process. So when you're ready to sign your user in, you also need to email them. Um, you'll need to email them a link using the send sign in with email link method while including the information for iOS or Android app packages, as well as a dynamic link for your Firebase project. If everything goes as expected, which Hopefully it does. <laughs> it is development, so who knows. Um, they should receive an email like the one in the screenshot that contains a sign-in link for your project. Clicking on that link should open your app for the user's device. Your app will immediately call the did change app lifecycle state flutter method when opened. You can check to see if the lifecycle state is resumed and then see if there's a dynamic link associated with that open app. If there is, then you can just go ahead and handle that use case. Uh, so this is actually the method that I use for handling that case. So generally the way you would do this is by calling Firebase auth sign in with email and link method to retrieve a Firebase user. And then finally, you can just go ahead and um, update your app's uh, state data so that the UI can then update and whatnot after everything has been changed. Uh, so the final auth type that I'm going to go over is Google sign in. So from my own experience, it's actually one of the easier third party authentication methods to use, but they also sign my paychecks, so I might be a little biased but that's all right. <laughs> uh, so you will first need to instantiate the Google sign-in object and then call the sign-in method on it. If the user's device is able to use Google sign-in, then it will be prompted with a um, sign-in dialog similar to this one. After the user has selected their account, you will receive a Google sign-in account object. You can use this to call authenticate against Google's identity provider service. Once the user is authenticated, you can retrieve their auth credentials from the Google auth provider. And then finally, you can retrieve the Firebase user using their uh, Google authenticated uh, credentials. Additionally, if the user has been previously authenticated, they can retrieve their Firebase user using the current user method. So next I want to talk about the two database options that are available in Firebase. The first one, real-time database, uses a simple JSON tree structure to store and access data. This data is stored and synced between users and devices. And its main goal is to provide a backend data uh, storage solution without having to go through the whole tedious process of setting up your own database server, authentication schema, threat endpoints, and basically everything else that goes along with trying to set up like a backend database infrastructure. So when you're trying to build something quickly, it's just already there for you. So the first thing we need to do is uh, to use the Firebase real-time database is create a Firebase database object in your app. You can then create a reference to a specific node in the JSON tree data structure. So in this case, this node is called messages and um, it's just a child of the root node. You can create as many references as you like, uh, such as this one um, in this part of the code, which creates a reference to the counter node 
and then just reads the value of that before uh, printing it. After you have your reference, you can associate with a listener in order to take actions on any data changes as they happen. And then um, finally, I want to introduce a new graphical widget from the Fire Flutter library called Firebase Animated List. So this works like a standard list, but it will animate as items are added or removed from it. And it works specifically with Firebase references to listen for data changes without having to tie everything together manually. So um, this widget doesn't actually if it's a set widget that doesn't work for your use cases, there's also just a standard Firebase list, which will just display a normal list that doesn't animate, and also a Firebase sorted list, which it sort of things. <laughs> uh, so for references, it's actually the same screenshot from the first real-time database slide uh, a couple of them ago with that animated list, just so you can kind of see it now that you have a little bit more context and how things will animate in and out on the screen. So the second option, Cloud Fire Store, <coughs> It's a database tool that allows you to group data using a document collection structure for straightforward access. It uh, offers many of the advantages of a real-time database, such as real-time syncing, offline support, and scalability, but also supports basic queries in addition to direct data access. One thing that's important to remember is that Cloud Firestore can be used in conjunction with the real-time database, um, and each actually serves its own unique purposes. So one doesn't replace the other, they kind of have their own unique cases that they fit in with. So like most things in Firebase, it only takes a few lines of code to do most of the common actions, like reading and writing data. So um, by first getting an instance of the Firestore object, you can retrieve a child collection from Firestore. And then once you have that collection reference, you only need one call to add a new document to it. So writing is super straightforward. Or you can use another call to retrieve all of the documents from that collection once. Uh, despite those two operations being actually super simple, now let's go ahead and take a look at something that's a little bit more complicated, like listening for changes to your data. So you can do this by creating a stream builder object that listens to a specific task in Firestore and updates whenever new data comes down. So while we won't get too deep into what a stream builder is, uh, you can kind of think of them in a similar way to futures of Flutter, except they're activated at any time new data is sent to them rather than just once an operation is completed. This object can then check to see if a data snapshot is available. If it isn't, then it can just return a standard default UI widget. Otherwise, you can retrieve that data from the snapshot, and then using that data, you can update your app state UI. So in this case, we're actually going to use the length of the data snapshot to define how large our um, list view should be. And then we're going to display a bunch of list tiles uh, in that list using the actual documents that have come down from Firestore. So while we've talked about Firestore options already, uh, sometimes you need to store and serve user-generated content, such as images or audio files, directly in your mobile app. You can do this using Cloud Storage for Firebase. Uploads and downloads handled by uh, the Cloud Storage SDK are resumable, making them more resilient to changes in network connectivity. So if your user kind of goes through the standard example of like a subway tunnel and they just lose connectivity, as soon as they come back out, it should just start resuming for them. Uh, when the user's connection is disrupted during an upload, the SDK will automatically handle retrying and resuming the same exact way, uh, which is just critical when dealing with any kind of network connectivity conditions that people can encounter on uh, mobile devices. Uh, once the user's content is uploaded, it can be shared with other users of your app using the same SDK. And since you will likely run into situations where only certain users should be able to see or upload specific content, uh, you can use Firebase's security rule system, along with Firebase authentication, which we just talked about, um, to restrict content according to your app's requirements. When you want to upload a data object uh, to cloud storage, you can get a reference to that storage path and then create a storage upload task by calling put file or put data on your storage reference with that item um, that you want to upload, as well as any metadata that you want to associate with that item. You can also save a reference to that task in order to pause, resume, or cancel the action depending on um, how you want to actually set up your prototype and app. Downloading a file is similarly easy. You can specify a storage reference for the file that you want to download and then get its download URL. And once you have that, you can pull down the file using an HTTP for handling backend logic for your app without having to set up a whole complicated backend where you post your code like manually and have to deal with all that setup process. This, you just basically write everything out in Node or TypeScript and then call like an upload method from a command line and it's just all out there and available for you. So uh, to provide a quick example, it's hosted via Firebase functions. So when it receives an HTTPS request, 
it'll get the date and respond with a hello message, as well as a current time date using Flutterfire's uh, HTTPS callable object with an optional data object. And then you can listen for the results asynchronously to update your app's UI. Um, kind of a big block that does very little. <laughs> so it just calls the method, waits for a response, and then prints it out. Um, so at the last FireConf, we also released a new product called Extensions, which are pre-made functions that handle common tasks for developers without having to reinvent the wheel. So you can find them in the console and see what's going to work for your app and what's not. But rather than having to like come up with your own um, common task, like um, sending an email or shortening a URL or translating text, you can actually just install these um, Firebase functions. Like you just hit them with an HTTP S request, and it'll just go ahead and actually work for you. So it saves you a little bit time, bit of time, and kind of helps you build something pretty quickly. And then, well, it's the only product that I'll talk about today that isn't a part of like Firebase and is build proofing. App distribution is great for app or toe typing uh, when you need to work with non-developers. So you can upload your APK or IPA file or group into the console so that people can receive and email as mobile developers to enhance their app's user experience by applying machine learning. Firebase ML provides a variety of models, label objects, and identify landmarks them through Firebase's easy-to-use APIs up in the cloud. So Firebase ML is a little bit more complex than other Firebase products, but it's still not too bad. Uh, for this example, the image prior to running this method, the two methods here that aren't defined in this snippet are concatenate planes to kind of help manipulate the image data so they can be analyzed properly, they can be analyzed properly by Firebase ML. Cool. <laughs> Uh, if you want to learn more about Flutter or Firebase in depth, then the top few links will give you a ton of information and resources, like code labs and videos, um, and why not. So for Flutter, I actually took out all the features available in Flutter Fire and the Gallery app. Um, so I'm going into planning and making sure that I talk up on Twitter um, on my account, me directly through my work email at PT Reese. Okay, uh, I restarted you as well. Functionality that you'd use more like an enterprise scale or even bigger. Um, but honestly, if you come in already knowing Google Cloud, then it is connected to a specific node. So if you, yeah, choosing it. So yeah, we actually have this document up and running um, in the Firebase docs, which will go. That's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, that was my question, so that that's helpful. Um, especially, I didn't know about that. Uh, uh, that it was it could tell you who was attached to the node. That's nice. Yep. Yeah, the presence API is pretty awesome. All right. Okay. So we have the next question from Anonymous. Is it only the prototyping or the complete app which can be released on Play Store that can be developed with Flutter? Oh yeah, no, you can actually release like full-on apps with Flutter out on the Play Store. Um, I don't remember completely offhand who is fully doing that right now. Um, I thought like Duolingo and a few other people were. But no, we actually have some big name apps that are out there fully in Flutter on the Play Store and the Apple Store. Hey guys, yeah, so this thing bug, it was me asking that question. Uh, am I audible? I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, so uh, I know that there was an earlier question that should we be based on the uh, Google Cloud. So uh, does that mean that using the Firebase Cloud uh, to deploy the backend, or you could also develop in Firebase? And is that correct understanding? Um, so, I mean, if you want to use both, I don't see why one would stop you. Um, so Firebase is actually built on data store and some other stuff. So there is a lot of like cross pollination in there. So if you wanted to use both, I don't see why there would be a problem with that. But you can you uh, you can use Firebase to test and then deploy them on the Google Cloud, right? That that's 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 a, that could also make a use case. No, I'm not quite sure what you mean by deploy on the Google Cloud. I can take a stab at this. I think what you mean. Um, is that you would just use the database, like the real-time database or the, the Firestore, but then you would go over to Google Cloud Platform and maybe put up a static um, web page in cloud storage, uh, and then maybe it would go connect to the Firebase API to do the hosting base. Is It kind of makes the hosting invisible to you. It takes, takes a lot of thing in Google Cloud. I think you're in for a little bit more work. Is that correct? <laughs> so actually, too, with um, host, we actually have like a web hosting tool as well, and um, like that's kind of one of the big strengths of Firebase is we abstracted a lot of the complexity of Google Cloud away, just to make it easy to throw it out there and work within it without having you know, like hit in the weeds of all the technical details of it. So sorry, but if I'm just hijacking, but I have one last question. Uh, so basically, if, uh, uh, if there was one thing where you showed that you could also call a Node.js uh, API within the Firebase, right? 
uh, yep. and then kind of you know convert the response into a JSON. So I might not just API onto the Google Cloud and scale it and whatever it all all the things that it offers. What is the trade-off where I would opt for Firebase? Um, I mean, the SDK that we have is kind of the big aspect of it. The cloud functions on Firebase are essentially very similar, if not the same, as the Google Cloud one. So it depends on what other stuff you're using from Firebase or Google Cloud that makes it worth using one over the other. Yeah, but are there any key things which would you know make it more uh, convenient or uh, from the feature significant to use Firebase or not really particular? Not, nothing in particular, no. Okay. Not for functions, yeah. Cheers, thanks. It was good. It was a little fast, but it's good content. Thanks for that. Cheers. I just want to, can I add to this, Paul, because of his question. And we have time, so I'm just trying to question. Um, uh, what I have found is that in cloud functions inside of Firebase specifically, right? If so, if I'm in Firebase, uh, I can, but I can actually go over to my cloud GCP project and I can see those same Firebase cloud functions and um, sometimes now I go over to, to uh, GCP to do my logging for my Firebase cloud functions, right? So I'm really mixing back and forth between, um, between Firebase and between Google Cloud Functions. Now, I don't have the right language, so it might be wrong for me to say this, so Paul, correct me, but it really seems like Firebase is like a softer UI interface in front of Google Cloud Platform. And I think the Cloud Platform, I can't really find the real-time database and I can't really find the Firestore. Maybe I'm wrong about that, um, but it seems like so I- That would be more like your, oh, I'm sorry. That would be more like your data store. Yeah, uh, yeah. But that, that's been my experience is that Firebase is is really a, a UI that it, um, is a little bit in front of Google Cloud Platform. And I've found almost every feature that you find in Firebase you can go wrangle that in Google Cloud Platform because I think under the hood, it really is just another Google Cloud Platform project. Paul, what's the details? What am I getting wrong there? Um, no, I mean, Firestore is built on clouds. So a lot of it is they're gonna be very similar stuff. It's just kind of, which is gonna be easier for you depending on the situation. So like, like you were saying, the uh, functions themselves are gonna be the same across GCP and Firebase. Uh, Real-time database, I don't think has anything analogous on GCP. Yeah, um, right. But yeah, but Firestore will. Uh, authentication, I think, is a little bit more uh, Firebase heavy. Oh. And then there's other stuff for authentication in cloud. So it just depends on some little differences in between on each of those products. For me, that was a big difference, actually. The, the authentication model on Firebase is wonderful. And if you want to do something similar on Cloud IAM, uh, or in GCP, you're in the I am world, and that's hardcore. That's and wanted to drag it out a little bit more. Uh, I, uh, can I give it over to you? I'm reading the questions. I don't know who's name. Yeah. Um, anonymous again. I like it. When is more convenient to use a Flutter or PWA with the view? view? I don't know. Yeah, with the yes. <laughs> that's the GS. Yes. That you also uh, multi platform and use it to deploy. So I've never used Vue, use Vue and great. Um, if you're interested in Flutter, also great. It just depends on like what's gonna actually work out for you. Okay, thanks. Cool. All right, so only for prototyping or can the app actually be published? No, it can actually be published. Yeah, so um, that can go up on uh, the Play Store and Apple and all that good stuff. Let me see if I can actually find while you're looking for that, um, someone mentioned this in the chat, and I want to bring it up too. This is a, a so I use Vue personally um, in my work life, and the reason that I would use Flutter, and I have to make this case later this week, um, the reason that I would use Flutter over Vue is because it's native, right? Um, so when you're thinking about Flutter, you're thinking about making a, a app a, a, for the device, right? The, it's going to be a native app running on like the the on the metal of that device, mean, meaning it goes as fast as possible. When you do Vue.js, you are not anywhere close to that fast. You're just a web app uh, running inside of, of, you know, Chrome effectively, uh, you know. Um, but so that there is a sort of a difference there. If you're trying to make an app fast, right, um, Vue is not going to get you there. You have some native stuff, um, right, and someone will probably talk about like, uh, you know, Angular Native and uh, 
those kinds of things. But that's really, uh, I just wanted to point that out. And the native nature of Flutter is what makes it uh, special compared to Vue, at least. That's in my experience. Yes, uh, I mean, it's going back to the slide where we we're talking about running on um, Skia. So same thing we're using for like Chrome or native Android and some other stuff where it's actually drawing out everything um, manually on C++. And then I guess that's the same answer for this next question with uh, Flutter versus React. <laughs> All right. So I guess we'll skip that question yeah. then. And we'll go to the next one. Apps are built with Flutter? I have no idea. So I'm not actually on the Flutter team on the Firebase side. Um, but I did pull up the showcases tab that you might be able to see here. So like Tencent is using uh, Flutter for their released app, Realtor.com. Um, Square, which I actually didn't know, and I do know that Flutter's running on pretty much all of like the Google Home devices that have a screen and whatnot as well. So it's kind of one of Google's big pushes for UI apps. Um, I guess New York Times as well. So yeah, there's some big names that are out there that are actually running on Flutter in production. Okay, next question is, what is the difference between Firebase and Firestore? Uh, so I'm assuming with Firebase being the real-time database, we actually run into... Um, so with that, it kind of goes back to that one database versus the other screen that we were looking at earlier. Um, so Firestore is going to be queries and um, kind of the document collection model versus the real-time database, which is using that case. Awesome. Uh, so while using authentication in Firebase, we have to log in every time we open the app. How can we make it a one-time login? So it depends on the product that you're using. Um, I haven't figured out a good way around this with the email and uh, password setup, but with the Google sign-in one, once the user's already signed in with Google and like they're authenticated on their mobile device or if they're using phone authentication, then you should be able to just kind of start the process and it'll already uh, go back and grab so then you can just kind of assume if they've already been authenticated, it'll just move the process along for you. Would the person who asked the question be willing to talk a little bit about their scenario? Um, I can tell you, uh, yeah. Uh, I'd like to, well, go ahead. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, so, hello. Uh, I was the person who asked this question, and uh, we were trying to build an app for, for an upcoming hack. So, we were very new to Flutter. We just discovered it a uh, couple of months ago, and we were trying to do the authentication in Firebase, and we came across this problem. We only uh, used email and password for the authentication. Uh, we did not use any other methods, and this was like one problem. We also work our way around it. So, uh, yeah. So you know what? Um, I just actually wrote down your question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to some people tomorrow uh, when I get like when we all get back on for work and whatnot. If you want to email me, I can see if I can get you some detail. Um, so that was that uh, P address, and I'm actually working on a series of like authentication blog posts with Flutter right now. So this would be something I could try to throw in there as well, just to make it a little bit more public if I can find anything that's worthwhile for people. Yeah, I think that would be great. That'd be yeah. terrific. Thank you so much. Question. I'll just drag this one out. Based on this authentication, um, um, and this is just, uh, again, this is something I've, I've had happen to me, and I'm pretty sure it's gremlins. It's magic. It's not actual code that's happening here, so let me just preface it with that, right? Um, we uh, we have a app, and we're using the authentication model, and Strangely, one of the first people um, who was helping me build and test the app, right when we were, you know, firing up the the authentication, at some point um, he could no longer get in there. But if he tries to use Chrome to uh, use this Firebase authentication, it's just a no-go. And I tell you, it's the strange. Um, it's been persistent across machines. Uh, so I'm not asking for you to, to you know, uh, to to solve this. Um, uh, because we've had nothing but success with this model and he this is just like like I said It's like magic. It's like he's got some special gremlin that's saying nope. You can't authenticate this this way Yeah, I haven't heard of that at all so Hopefully that's rare if not then I need to go talk to people <laughs> All right um, Question I, I can take the next one and it has to upload it goes like this. How do we move away from this messaging of prototyping in Flutter to real large-scale app? I feel like it is still in its infancy stage. Can you provide a few examples? Um, yeah, so again, New York Times, Square. So there are some examples of people that are using it. I, I would honestly say like the story behind Flutter has changed a lot in the last 
year or so where they've just kind of polished everything and made it less beta-y <laughs> and pretty solid as it is. Okay. Yes, Next one. Do we need to use a dart with butter or we use something like a um, so Kotlin's going to be your footer is only Dart at this point, uh, but if you do need to like tie into native packages, then you would bridge over using uh, platform channels into Kotlin or Swift and whatnot, depending on which platform you're working with. So um, a lot of that you'll see if you look at open source projects for accessing the camera or Bluetooth and some other stuff. Um, actually, if you look at the Flutter Fire GitHub repo, we actually use a lot of that for accessing the platform specific SDKs for Firebase on the Flutter side. So the Flutter Fire um, library is just basically on top of the actual SDKs that you would run on that device. Cool. All right, so next uh, is why can't we call it native API isn't Flutter native itself? Uh, <laughs> it's a just a platform that's actually on the native side of it, like the C++ side, but it's not, like Dart itself doesn't have direct access to the actual platform that it's running on without going through those platform channels. So you still have a bridging process, it's just a little bit more work than just saying from the Android side of it. So that's just a whole architecture mess, essentially. <laughs> Next. Perfect. So um, the next one is uh, no SQL on Firebase is a new paradigm for me. If there is there some advice to migrate my concepts of entities, relations, and tables from the SQL world? Uh, let me see if I can find some of those. So um, I can never say his last name. I actually, made up that goes over a lot of this in detail, like how about for no SQL databases. Um, I'm just gonna see if I can find them real quick for you. Sure. While he's but, uh. Yeah, um, if you go while you're looking at that up, I can tell you the, the biggest cheat or the biggest uh, secret to going from one to the other is with, uh, with SQL, the complexity is when you're querying. You're looking for a, you, you write a complex list of questions on data uh, to get the data you want. That's how SQL tr works, right? A select statement. With the big difference with uh, the JSON world is that you write, you, 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 all the complexity is in the writing. You, re, you actually duplicate your data a lot in, in a way um, if you're from the SQL world, right? You feel like, I shouldn't be copying this again, I should, but you don't. You duplicate data so that it looks like your view. And so the, basic, the uh, simplest starting point is with SQL, you have a complex reading, a complex select. And with, um, with the JSON world, you have a complex writing so that when you read, the data already looks the way that you want it to look. Can I mark it answer to this question? I think he has, yeah, Paul, you have some so, references, right? Oh, yeah. So I actually just posted the um, link for this YouTube playlist of all of Todd's stuff. It goes over a whole bunch of stuff of how like NoSQL and Firestore actually works in the um, meetup chat. Um, I guess I can also share this out on Twitter, too, later for people that want it. Um, but then the other thing I was going to do here, so this is actually an app that I'm in the middle of developing right now. But you can actually uh, use references, which are pretty great. So. Like in this one, I have these flashcards and they're just broken up into sections. And what this is doing is just referencing back to another section. So you don't have to keep duplicating everything per se. But mm -hmm. what you can do is actually say, hey, I have this information already stored off in this different part of the structure and it just reference back to it. Um, so again, it's just a whole different way of thinking about how you're storing your data and using it. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of that's gonna be covered by that YouTube video and then there's some documentation around it as well. I'm not sure if this first question was answered or was upvoted and come, came up. <laughs> I will ask her. Uh, how does Firebase pricing compare to DDP? So a lot of the pricing is going to be just completely separate because they are separate products. We actually have this firebase.google.com pricing page. Um, so we actually have this to upgrade to like a pay-as-you-go place plan. Um, but then even when you go into that pay-as-you-go tier, everything within that free quota is still free up until you've used up that limit. So um, things like A-B testing, analytics, and some other stuff is always free. Um, authentication, you get like your 10,000 authentication calls per month. Once um, you go over a certain amount of data and requests per day, some other things of that sort. Um, and 
I think another question just got upvoted. <laughs> so, uh, in, in Flutter, I encountered a lot of errors because you have crash analytics with Flutter. Uh, so we do have crash analytics for Flutter, and I have that running at a different sample app. Um, actually, I keep the Flutter. Let me see if I can find that for you real quick. Also has an example of crash analytics running. Let's see, so I'll share this tab. Yes, we actually have crash analytics running on the uh, Flutter Fire GitHub. So you can look through that. If you do run into issues, though, we actually have the Firebase support team, um, which is actually part of what I run. So that's like my main job, um, where they can answer all these questions to you. So if you run into these different crashes and you're just not quite sure what's going on with them and you can't find answers online, you can reach out to us and we'll have somebody available to. And next question, it says, is there a chat or messaging plugin? Uh, so we have Firebase messaging for like notifications and some other stuff. For the chat part, you'd probably have to make that yourself. I know that I've seen a lot of examples using the real-time database though, um, to actually have that real-time chat aspect of it. Um, we actually have some videos from Puff from IO a couple years ago, where he made a chat app, a chat app uh, from scratch using real-time database. So you might want to just check into that and see how they did it. But yeah, nothing out of the box immediately. Which one was that one? I didn't mark it, sorry. No, 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 that's okay. I guess like a little first one was, uh, you can mark it as an answer. This one? Yeah. And now is the next question. As Android, to use Material iOS and other styles. How Flutter make the adjustment between both? Yep, uh, so that was actually one of the slides that we covered a little bit ago. Let me see if I can find that here real quick for you. Let's see. Here we go. Let's present this. Uh, so that would be in your UI. So if they're on iOS, then you're going to give them this Cupertino slider, which is coming out of this Cupertino Dart package or if they're on like web or mobile, then this slider is going to be a standard material one. This is where, it took me a while to understand this, but, uh, and I'm, I'm going to do a little segue here, right? Um, it took me a while to understand this. Um, I understood that it was just, you know, the code that you're writing isn't um, what the device is running. It's sort of getting recompiled for that native language. And uh, games, uh, work like that, right? When you make video games, oftentimes you're trying to write it in one platform and distribute it to many platforms. So you'll write it in C++ to the native platform like the Xbox or the PC. And that's almost exactly what Dart and Flutter is doing, right? It's giving you this one language and you write it one way, the difference. So like maybe, Paul, tell us about this, right? Because um, Apple iOS 14 has come a whole lot to make sure that when that comes through, uh, <laughs> when that comes through, you know that 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 those widgets still work, right? Because Dart's going to try to write uh, a file that works on the new iOS 14. Tell us about that. Huh? Oh man, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> that might be more something for the actual Flutter team to tell you how that part's going to work. Yeah, how it works, but yeah. but but conceptually, right? Though you got some guys back there that are and and, and folks that are really uh, making it happen. Um, so that we don't have to oh, worry sure, about yeah. the changes, <laughs> you know. Um, yep. Yep. Uh, so I want to put yeah. you on the spot before the next question because I, I brought up that games thing. Um, without an audio support, gosh, I don't, I don't really see how yeah. that's working, right? They must, people must be working very hard to make a game in Flutter because they have to make their own audio layer. Yep. Yeah, no, so I mean, games is probably one of the big areas where I wouldn't use Flutter. Um, it's a great tool for other things, but when it gets to that point, it's kind of hit and miss. Um, there are some third-party packages that will give you audio support, but again, it's not going to be as easy as some other things, like some of the other Android or iOS third-party uh, SDKs for games, since it's a nice little segue. We actually have uh, Firebase SDKs for Unity that are working, so it's something to route and then be able to access to all the stuff in Firebase that way. That's really good. That's really good to know because the 60 frames per second that Flutter promises almost makes you think, ooh, games, but you're saying, nope, Unity might be uh, the route there. Yeah, I'd probably definitely go with like the Unity route for that one. And plus, you're still going to get the whole cross-platform aspect of it because Unity is built from the ground up for running similarly natively on uh, different platforms. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yep. What's up, Ben? 
to jump on uh, the next question, uh, the question about uh, uh, Android and uh, iOS. I want to ask the question about the, the same looking on Android and on iOS also. Okay. Well, yeah, so depending on which components you're using. The looking, the looking, once we have called our application, uh, 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 we going to have the same looking on uh, Android and on iOS. I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit there. Um, yeah. We have some problems with your audio. Can you ask your question in Slido and we will answer to you. We will take your question as well. And Ben, I'll cover for you because I think I know what you're asking. Uh, ask it in Slido and then uh, I'll see if I can get it right. I think he's saying the apps don't look the same if you're in iPhone version. And that's because the widget, let's just say, I don't know, the, the slider widget, right, on the side is going to look one way in Androids. And it, I think he, I think that's what he's wondering is what about that? Gotcha. Yep. Uh, so the platform has a lot of this stuff, so like what we have on this screen here. But then um, I think a lot of it's also just kind of automatically handled as well, so it kind of conforms to what's standard on that device, so that you don't have to like have an uh, iOS app that looks like it was done on Android. That's a part of the native thing, then, right? It keeps it feeling native. Yep. So it's just going to draw it out depending on which I. Uh, OS that it's actually running on. Okay, great. Let's go to the next question. All right, uh, next question is, how does Flutter scale with larger applications? Does it have a lot of nesting? So yes, there's a lot of nesting, but it does scale really well with larger applications. Um, so the team that actually works on Flutter has done a whole bunch of optimizations to make that less awful. <laughs> um, so they actually are like, doing some weird things to traverse um, the different nodes and whatnot that are inside of that tree hierarchy. And so, and then everything is just being drawn um, every time when it needs to be done. It seems super long. You don't run into a lot of like um, jitter and whatnot. It, uh, the anonymous is the VIP of the night. All, all the questions are from this anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Very smart person, anonymous, right? Very good questions, that anonymous person. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, in real time uh, database, yep, uh, so what you would want to do, so I don't have anything actually in this tree, I thought I did, but what you would do is basically each user would base their ID from off, you can then create a node for them inside the real time database, and then what you would do is you'd use your um, security rules to make sure that they're off so that only that user can read that node out of the real time database. Um, big emphasis on security rules though, make sure that you actually have them set up and secure for your users just so they're uh, not viewing the wrong data or no one else has access to their data. Okay. Next question. If the app is using the Google authentication, the Flutter app, should we need to take any permission to publish the app on the Play Store? Not that I know of. I think it should be pretty solid. Uh, the only thing I would find about the SHA-1 that you would have, so um, let's say we have an Android app, um, if you put in a SHA-1 here um, for your debug key, you're actually going to want to also release key. Otherwise, the app itself will play links because it's not going to be signed with the same certificate that you're using with Firebase. So that's uh, probably the only consideration I would really consider um, with authentication and actually putting things up on the Play Store. And what you just said there is actually more tricky than you just made it sound, right? <laughs> like yeah, there's, a, nice. there's a little there's a little bit of detail, and I I haven't personally done it. I've kind of been looking for an excuse to go through that process uh, because you know we've been using our apps internally um, in this world in using Firebase um, and in.